know, global methane sources and projections, but this is without the tipping points that can come with climate change. So that's what we should be worrying about. This is showing how the Earth can go in and out of ice ages, but if you push the Earth too far past the normal place where we would go back into an ice age, which is what we're doing, then we could go into a, a very different state that we have not seen for tens of millions of years rather than just a few hundred thousand years. So while atmospheric CO2 is rising at an accelerated rate of about 0.7% per year today, it's 47% above pre-industrial levels right now. But methane is 300% higher than pre-industrial. And what's remarkable about that is that methane will oxidize in the presence of oxygen with a half-life of only 12 years. Whereas CO2 is very tough and it'll last for tens of thousands of years. So clearly there's large, large sources of methane that must be going into the atmosphere that are not being oxidized away near fast enough because we've got 300% more than pre-industrial. Now it was leveling a bit for a while and there's still some question about why. Um, the most common theory I've heard is that it was the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s and then took them quite a while before they really got going again. And they're one of the major producers of natural gas. And um, now, of course, we've become um, the big producer, and that's through fracking. The IPCC, which is highly politically uh, affected, had assumed that methane levels would simply decline by 37 percent uh, by 2050. So that's what's in their climate models. Obviously, that's not happening. So what about an even larger uh, problem with methane that might, might happen? At least there is some good news. Um, so some have worried about the, the so-called 50 gigaton burp of methane coming out of methane hydrates. So there's methane hydrates that are believed to be very deep underground. Is this a valid worry? Probably not. So in the Arctic Ocean, the shelf there, the East, Ant uh, the, uh, East Siberian shelf, is about 50 meters below sea level. But the uh, clathrates, or the methane hydrates, are only stable at levels of about 350 meters below sea level. So they would be far below the level of the ocean sediments. And so the only way heat could get down there would be by conduction. And conduction is a very, very slow process. So after all the reading that I've done, study I've done on this, I'm not, they're not very worried. I mean, I'm a little bit worried, but nowhere near as much as, as some people are about the methane hydrates. There are other processes, however, that can heat the sediments uh, more quickly than is typical. So, for example, river discharge, which is not in the IPCC models, uh, causes increased uh, turbulence and can bring heat to the bottom. And there is evidence that methane hydrates have destabilized in the past. Not recently, but there's this interesting work that was done in the uh, area off Svalbard, which is an island north of, of Norway. And those are all methane explosion craters, some of them as large as a kilometer across. So that's more than half a mile across. And they dot the landscape down there. Those are about 320 meters deep, though, so those are at the level that we expect methane hydrates could still exist. Um, they've been age dated and they're about 20,000 years old. Still, they are leaking today. They're still leaking methane, but at a, a pretty low rate. Right. Is, yeah. is there any um, uh, speculation on why they, that happened a while back? Well, that's a good question because. I've tried to figure out, was there an ice cap over that part of um, the ocean basin back during the last ice age? There are people saying, no, there was no ice cap over East Siberia. This is really not East Siberia, this is probably less than that. Uh, was there an ice cap over here? Because if there was, then that would act as the pressure stabilizer 
And then when the ice cap disappeared at the end of the last ice age, then the pressure would drop and then they could become unstable. If there are cracks in the rock, then that could have uh, led to these explosions. Maybe this subsurface um, was higher in, in the past when there was less pressure. And maybe it sank. Um, Down the road. Well, given that it's at 320 meters now, it seems like it's if it had an ice cap on it, that would certainly provide stability, but then when you remove it, it would that would be enough. I think if you just sprung. remove the ice cap, you don't need to have it go up or down. It probably would have sprung back up with an ice cap. Uh, uh, re rebound, more. geodetic rebound is yeah. is slow though and small, very small, not, not many, many years. I guess the point is that uh, there is some evidence for methane craters that can happen, but it, it doesn't look like it's uh, about to happen over East Siberia. But here's something that, that maybe is more worrying. It's called the compost bomb instability. It was an instability discovery and written up in 19, or, uh, rather 2010 and 2011. It has to do with the warming rate, the rate at which the air temperature is warming and conducting down into where the, the peat is. So if that warming rate is higher than 0.088 degrees centigrade per year, then you trigger the instability. So there's the soil temperature response to the atmospheric temperature forcing, which is shown underneath. And if it goes past uh, this critical 0.088, or you can express it in terms of per century, which is what they have up there, so eight degrees per century. It's a warming rate, though. You don't need a full century to do this. You just need that rate to exist. And you need that rate to exist for about 15 years. And then you could set off this instability. So when I read across these papers, I immediately thought, well, OK, we know the rate at which temperatures are warming. Is that significant up here? Turns out the Arctic is warming two or three times faster than the rest of the planet. And it does look like it's a degree. So this is from Lawrence et al. in 2008. And when you lose the Arctic ice, the Arctic Ocean ice, then it sends a pulse of heat down past the Arctic uh, coastline down into the permafrost area. And what you see on the left there is the degrees centigrade per decade. And so that's uh, 0.1 degrees centigrade per year. And that's slightly over um, this trigger point. So this does look like it's a worry, actually. Basically, all those red areas, but not the brown areas, which are frankly below the, thermo, below the permafrost area, but the red areas are all uh, predicted to be rising at rates that are exceeding this trigger point. I haven't really seen much on that. I haven't seen a whole lot of papers or uh, people doing YouTubes and panic about this. Um, I don't, I'm not sure why, but uh, just looking at the numbers, putting it all together, it looks like this is actually a worry. So are we losing the Arctic Ocean ice? Well, you all know that we are, and we're losing it at an accelerating rate. It will probably be gone in a decade or so. And so you have to worry about the permafrost carbon feedback. So when you lose permafrost, you lose the carbon in it. There's as much carbon in the permafrost as there, in, there is in the atmosphere and in all the plants and animals, or uh, plants, well, plants and animals, sure, on land. Add them both together and multiply by two. That's how much you have in the permafrost. So there's a lot of carbon available. It's probably not all going to come out at once, but it can come out, and as it does, it's going to affect climate. These are thermal karst lakes. The thing about lakes is when lakes form like this, then they hide the vegetation underneath from oxygen, and then the carbon is going to combine with hydrogen instead of combining with oxygen. Carbon combined with oxygen is what you'd rather have, that's CO2. Yes, it's a greenhouse gas, but methane is 100 times more powerful as it first emerges. So you'd really rather have that come out as CO2. There's methane explosion craters that are happening in Siberia.
And the new CMIP 6 models, which are going to be incorporated into the new IPCC assessment report number six, which is due to come out in a couple of years, is confirming the work that I've been talking about for years now in my public talks from Friedrich et al. And, and others, and that is that the equilibrium climate sensitivity to a doubling of CO2 is not the three degrees that the older studies were showing, but is more like five degrees. So this is a slide that I've shown before, but only after a much longer uh, description to get up to it. But I'm really trying to cut this one down because I know I, I tend to be, in Jill Cody's word, dense and intense <laughs> talks. And so I'm trying to be a little bit less dense, a little less intense. But, um, this is showing the atmospheric CO2 predicted. If we have ECS of five degrees, which it looks like we may very well have, and now including the methane that is also going to be coming out of the permafrost. Um, as the permafrost melts, all the experts are expecting that most of it, 97%, is going to be CO2. Only about 2.3% is expected to come out as methane, although there's reasons to think that might be a little optimistic. Mm -hmm. Let's assume 2.3%. But because it's 100 times more powerful as it comes out, it basically that little 2.3% equals the same amount of greenhouse warming as all the CO2. So it's a big deal. On the slide there, it says mission starting at 3, what is it, 3039? Three, 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 but last, last three, three, years. Zero. Oh. 30 years from now. 30? 30 years from now, yeah. So, right, so the, right, the punchline, the really alarming thing about this graph that you should take away is this is not business as usual on into the future. So you've no doubt heard a lot of dire predictions as well. You know, if we continue with business as usual to 2100, you know, we may have six or seven degrees temperature rise. This is assuming we shut off all emissions. Humans turn a key and no more industrial emissions, no more burning of coal or natural gas or anything in 2050. So that's just 30 years from now. It assumes we stay on business as usual till then, and then we shut off the key. I think that's pretty optimistic. Could we do that? I mean, if we really got scared and we really got alarmed, I don't know. I, uh, I'd like to say yes. I can't find my way to saying yes because I don't think I really believe it. Um, in the real world with real people and the real wants, I think short-term wins and long-term doesn't. And uh, we want to have a good life right now, today. Mm -hmm. And so that means Energy. Energy is necessary for everything. Um, I put in another graph above the last one based on a more recent study from Entenmann, and they're showing that when you include the short wavelength forcings for methane and for nitrous oxide, that you have another 23% on top of what the, the studies by McDougall et al. and then corrected for the fact they didn't have methane in there were showing. So I think this graph tells you that we're going to have to do a lot more than just end all emissions. <laughs> so the idea of just slowly transitioning our way to a more renewable future, that's not enough. <laughs> Maybe 50 years ago that would have been reasonable and we could hope for that. But we've waited too long and we've done nothing. And so now we need geoengineering. And geoengineering I think is going to be absolutely necessary. And then the question is, how do we do it safely? So I, I have a whole much longer talk that I gave last spring. And I'll be giving another talk this coming spring. I'll need to put it together. But it will include that and talk about the safety criteria that we need to think about before we, we go do Did you make here. this graph, uh, Rick? Pardon? Did you make this graph? Uh, this is a graph from McDougall et al. in 2012. And then I added the black curves. Okay. Yeah. And the rest of us. But there are reasonable estimates. So we really do have a climate emergency. And the last thing I want to do is to, is to put together this film with now what are we going to do about climate. So 
the safest thing, the safest geoengineering that you can do is to pull CO2 back out of the atmosphere. And I just read a, an interesting paper that actually is kind of hopeful. I mean, actually made me feel a little bit of a smile. Yeah. Hasn't happened in a while. I think, was it you who sent it, Michael? This is the one about the battery. At, the battery uh, Edgar, the Edgar Ross originally sent it, and then I sent the, the, the journal uh, over the article, that had the, the journal article that had it in it. You didn't yeah. send that. So being able to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere with a, a, a battery kind of technology using nanotubes. But, it's standard, the chemical they're calling it? Standard temperature and pressure, which lowers the cost quite a bit. By a factor of 10. So if you take that CO2 and then you pump it underground where it came from and sequester it, you leave the life on the surface of the planet where we all live alone, which is what we ought to do. And you also take the Earth back along the same system trajectory that got us here. Those are the two safety criteria for safe geoengineering. Here's the problem. We're fracking the hell out of all of the geologic formations mm. that we would like to use mm. as places to store it. Uh, every time you, you crack the heck out of the, the rock, you're not going to be able to go down there and glue it back together. I haven't seen anybody talk about that. Somebody should talk about that. Somebody besides me. Okay, does anybody have any other questions?